Otherwise, you'd better. Not because you want one anyway. You'd better. That's why they gave me all the big money. I'm going to give you one. Okay? Good. <laughs> so I want to talk about the message of life. Um, I'm going to read two different passages this morning for our scripture reading. Uh, the second one will be from Mark 16, which is just a short couple of verses, which... Uh, speaks about specifically the day of the resurrection of Christ from the book of Mark. Uh, and uh, before we get to that, I'm going to start off in the book of John, chapter 11. And this is the passage where Jesus talks about himself being the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And so that's the passage we're going to cover there, along with the story of when Jesus uh, raised Lazarus from the dead. Right? So it's all about resurrection and about resurrection life. And that's the message of life that we're going to talk about here this morning, okay? So, everybody have a Bible? If not, you should repent, okay? Pull out a Bible, and first of all, turn to John chapter 11, and then if you want to get ready, you can hold your finger in Mark chapter 16, and we'll flip right over there when we're done with John chapter 11. Okay, everybody have that? John 11, verses 1 through 45. So let's begin there with verse 1. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother, brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, A short while ago the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary, comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, <clears throat> she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the G Jews, who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave cloths and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had See, and had seen what Jesus did, put their faith in him. Also Mark chapter 16 and verses 1 through 6. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, Who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not Well, today, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is risen. Obviously, we know this story that three days earlier, he had shed his blood on the cross, and he died there, a very real death, and he died that death in order to pay the penalty for our sins. But we also know from all the scripture that that was not the end of the story. In fact, Jesus rose from the dead, and he is alive now as the King of kings and as the Lord of lords, and he will be alive forever in eternity future. This fact of the resurrection of Christ and his eternal life is the message that the world most desperately needs. Our world is a mess, but there's a message of life.
to somebody who does have the power to defeat death. And his name is Jesus. See, it is true that death is more powerful than us. We can't stop death in our physical power. But death is not more powerful than God. It's more powerful than us, but it is not more powerful than God. We can beat the enemy of death by placing our lives in God's hands as a commitment of faith. That's what Jesus talks about in this passage in John chapter 11. You see, if we try to battle death on our own, we are going to fail. But death can't touch us if we are in God's protective hands. Okay? So the answer is, we need to get into God's protective hands. And when we are, then we can defeat this enemy called death. This is what Jesus was talking about here in John 11, right? When he said these words, talking uh, to Martha, he said this in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice that? I am the resurrection and the life. Right? We need to be safely in Jesus' hands because he's the resurrection and the life. We're not, but he is. We don't have power over death, but Jesus has power over death because he is the resurrection. And as long as we're safely in his hands, then we also can experience the resurrection. Because he is the resurrection, if we're with him, then we experience the resurrection. Without Jesus, we're in trouble. Okay? You get the picture there? Jesus says, I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Okay? All of us here today, this morning, can give testimony about someone that we love who has gone on before us in physical death. But we have a promise here, don't we? That Jesus can overcome that death. Right? Because he says, whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. Is my microphone acting mm -hmm. up, honey? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Try to just ignore that. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Right? Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He said very plainly uh, to Martha there. <coughs> Notice the response that Martha gives in verse 27. And this is where, like, how do you put yourself safely into God's hands? This is how Martha did it. She said, yes, Lord. It's as simple as that. Yes, Lord, I place my hands, my life into your hands, right? Yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. See, it's a commitment of faith when we simply place our lives into Jesus' hands, because he is the resurrection. And when we're in his hands, then we also experience the resurrection. Jesus kind of talks about this as well in John chapter 14. Okay, in verse 6, Jesus said very plainly, okay, we're safe in his hands, right? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. Here he is saying it again. Jesus is saying, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you try to get to God by some other way, if you try to defeat death in your own power, you will lose. But if you come to the Father through me, if you put yourself into my hands, then you're going to reach the Father. Because Jesus says, I am life. You want life? Come to me. Come to me. He says, he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He says the same thing also in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. I love this, these verses here, right? Because death is a very scary thing, right? Okay, those of us who have faced that ourselves or with someone we love, it's a very scary thing. But here's what Jesus says, because he is the resurrection and the life, right? Here's his words in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. He says this, do not be afraid. Oh, but Jesus, death is a very scary thing. That's right. But what Jesus is saying, if you have me, you have nothing to be afraid of. Right? Verse 17, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. Right? He was then, he is now. When Jesus rose from the dead, he never went back there again. He's alive today, just like he was alive then. So he says these words. Verse 18, I am the living one. I was dead for three days. Right? I was dead. Behold, I am alive forever and ever. And then he says the statement at the very end of verse 18. He says, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Jesus 
holds the keys. He holds the keys of death. He can prevent death. He can rescue us from death. The enemy of death has no authority over us because Jesus has the keys. And if we're safely in Jesus' hands, then the keys unlock that enemy of death from affecting us because he can give us the gift of eternal life. You see, life is worth the living because of our commitment of faith and how it places our lives into God's hands and thereby defeats death.
said, see how he loved him. What I have to say to you this morning is, Jesus loves you every bit as much. See, the message of life proclaims that we can experience a true love relationship with God. You know the old kid song, right? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that is a message of life. There's one more thing that the message of life proclaims. Third thing I want to share with you this morning is this. The message of life proclaims that the good news will save the lives of multitudes of people. Multitudes of people. You see, there are uncountable multitudes of people that in the end will be saved because of their faith in Jesus. You know, right now sometimes we lose perspective because we look around us in the world and we see a whole bunch of people that aren't saved, right? And we start to wonder, oh my goodness, what's going on in this world? It's the whole world is going against Jesus. No, in fact, they're not. In fact, multitudes of people have believed in Jesus and multitudes of people will believe in Jesus and will be saved. And those multitudes of people are going to experience life forever. They're going to enjoy heaven as a place of eternal life. God's kingdom of eternal life will be filled with people experiencing things like love and joy and peace, unhindered by any form of death or pain or sin. The devil is doomed. Right now he's still running loose. But guess what? He's doomed and he is going to lose. Jesus and life is going to win. Our sins will be forgiven. And think about heaven. Think about the multitudes of people that are going to be there. And it might take us a billion years to meet every person in heaven. I think we're going to get an opportunity to do that. And it's okay if it takes a billion years. You know why? Because we can do it all over again a trillion times. And eternity will have just begun. It's a billion times a billion times a billion. More money than the government can spend. Okay? You get it? <laughs> That's how many years are going to be in eternity. Right? It's forever. Forever life. Life forever. On and on and on and on. Who could even begin to fathom this awesome mystery? See, the truth is, this has been God's plan from the very beginning. When God said this in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve, <coughs> He said these words, Be fruitful and, listen carefully, and multiply and fill the earth. Why did God say that? Why did He want people to multiply? Why did He want Adam and Eve to fill the earth with a bunch of babies and a bunch of people, ultimately? Why? Maybe because God loves people. Maybe because God wants a multitude of people to share eternal life with. I think that's what he had in mind. That's why God said that. He wants to share his life with multitudes. And when you think about human history, really all of human history is the story of God rescuing man from sin and death to embrace his life, so that these multitudes can experience eternal life. That's why God gave us as Christians this thing called the Great Commission, to go into all the world with the good news of this message of life, so that multitudes can experience life, eternal life. Now, I know some people are going to reject that message, right? Maybe you've talked to some of them. Maybe they told you to get lost. You're a Jesus freak. Don't bother me. Okay? Don't let them bother you. You have the message of life. And it's the message that people desperately need to hear. Because they, some may reject, but here's the good news. Many will receive it. Multitudes will embrace the message of life. Many, in the end, will be saved. 
This is exactly what Jesus said. The very last verse I read in John chapter 11 said that, right? Jesus said, or it says in the passage, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. Many put their faith in him. And that started the ball rolling. And ever since that day, there have been more and more and more people who have embraced life from God through faith in Jesus. There's multitudes that are gathering in this place called heaven. It's about God's glory ultimately. If you look at John chapter 11 and verse 4, right? Okay, when you look at the glory of God and you know God sharing His glory, okay, this is what it's about. It's about these multitudes of people that are coming to heaven to, etern uh, to eternal life. This is what he was talking about there in verse 4. He said, when he had heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death because God's got a bigger plan. Okay? Notice what he says. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. You see, God is looking at these multitudes of people. Every single saved life will bring glory to God. And His eternal glory will be magnified by a gazillion people praising His name forever. God will deserve every ounce of glory that we're going to give Him because of the multitudes of people that He will save. Notice how He says it there as well in verse 40. John 11 verse 40 says this, that Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, and if multitudes believe, you will see the glory of God. Heaven will be the glory of God on display because heaven will be filled with multitudes of people who have been saved. You have to see that picture. Now, obviously by faith in Jesus, as these multitudes of people are saved and see the glory of God, that is the message that we have to proclaim. You see, life is worth living because we have this wonderful privilege of sharing this good news so that multitudes of people can be saved and experience resurrection life. But in order for those multitudes to be saved and experience that, guess whose job it is to tell them? Ours. Okay, thank you. I see you're still awake. That's good. It's our job, right? I read it in Mark chapter 16 this morning. <coughs> And just after that passage that I read in Mark 16, where it had said that Jesus had risen, Jesus then speaks to those who had witnessed his resurrection, and he calls them at that point. Right? So he rises from the dead. What's the very next thing that Jesus says? He gives them a commission to become ambassadors of the message of life. You see, here's the critical thing that we need to see, is that multitudes of people are waiting for us to bring them the life-saving good news of Jesus, the glorious message of life. I'm preaching it to you here this morning, but there are multitudes of people out there that I can't talk to right now. Guess whose job it is to go reach those people to preach the message of life? It's your job. You're hearing the message of life, but guess what? God has also called you to be preachers of the message of life. So I'm not the only preacher here this morning. Guess who else is the preacher here this morning? Every single one of you out here. This is what Jesus says in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. Right? Turn back there. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. It says this. It's called the Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Who is he saying that to? All of us, okay? Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Do you think this is an important message that we have to carry? Do you realize that people's lives and eternities hang in the balance depending on whether or not you're willing to take this message of life to them? Jesus gave us commission. He said, go into all the world and preach the good news. And the people's lives hang in the balance as to whether or not we're going to be obedient to that calling. There is nothing
nothing more important in life than this message of life. God is all about life, and our life now is to be about His wonderful message of life. So these three things are the proclaiming of the message, what it's all about, right? The message of life proclaims that the enemy of death can be defeated, right? We can beat the enemy of death. Our lives, if we place them in God's hands through a commitment of faith, will defeat the enemy of death. The second thing as well is that we can experience a true love relation with God. We know that Mary and Martha and Lazarus experienced that love relationship. The truth is, you also can experience that love relationship. And the third thing was that the good news will save lives of multitudes, multitudes of people so that they might enjoy eternal life in God's kingdom. And we can be ambassadors for that message. But I have three questions for you this morning. In light of those three things. Okay? We know that the enemy of death can be defeated when we give our lives into God's hands as a commitment of faith. So the question is, have you done that? Have you opened that door that Jesus has the keys for by putting your life into his hands? Right? You can defeat death. Nobody here has to be worried about death. How do you do that? You put your life into Jesus' hands as a commitment of faith. So my simple question is, have you done that? Because if you have, then you have defeated death. My second question, in light of the second thing is, talks about a true love relationship with God. So my question is this. Are you now experiencing a love relationship with God? Oh, well, yeah, Pastor, I go to church once in a while. That's not, the, that's not what I ask you. Is it? Here's what I want to know. Are you experiencing a love relationship with God right now? Like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Because God wants you to experience a love relationship. Jesus loves us, this we know. For the Bible tells us so. But are you reading the Bible so that you know that? So that you can fall in love with Jesus? Are you talking to Him in prayer so that you might have this wonderful love relationship where Jesus talks to you and you talk to Jesus? Are you experiencing that love relationship? You can. All you have to do is open the Bible and start talking to Jesus. And you can have a love relationship. And the last thing, if I had to ask you, ask you a question about that, okay, we can acknowledge the truth, right, that the good news is going to save multitudes of people so that they might enjoy eternal life. But my question is this, have you taken up the privilege of being a person who is obedient to the Great Commission to preach that good news to those that you can reach so that they might be saved as well? and experience eternal life? Have you been walking in obedience to Jesus' great commission? I hope that the answer to all these questions this morning for you is yes. Because Jesus asks us, do you really believe this message of life? This is really what I think he's getting to there in John 11. And I'll read those two verses just in closing again. Okay, from John 11. Verses 25 and 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Father in heaven, when I come to you now this morning in the name of Jesus, and Father, I want to proclaim right here and right now that I know for myself, Father, I believe this truth yes. about Jesus and the resurrection, that he holds the keys of death, and that I don't need to worry about the enemy of death, because I have placed my life into Jesus' hands as a commitment of faith. But Father, right now, if there's anyone else here this morning who has never done that, I pray that right now they will simply uh, bow their hearts before you in prayer and place their 
their life into your hands. That they will simply surrender themselves to you in faith. Make a commitment of faith. And Father, as they do that, we know that your promise says that you will help them to cross over the threshold of death and experience eternal life. Father, they will defeat the enemy of death at the moment they place their lives in the hands of Jesus as a commitment of faith. And Father, I also want to experience this true love relationship, just like you uh, spoke about and hear about Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Father, it is clear from Scripture that you love these people, that when they wept, you wept. Jesus, I thank you that I know that when I go through a tough time in life, things that cause me to weep, that you are right there alongside of me, weeping along with me. Father, help me to walk more closely in that love relationship. Father, right now I pray for anyone here that right now feels as though they haven't been walking as closely as they should with you in that love relationship. Father, I just pray that they would simply turn to you in faith, begin to immerse themselves in the Word of God and commit themselves to coming to you in prayer. Father, I know that through those things, they will experience you and experience a greater measure of your love. Father, pour out your love into the hearts of these people right now. And Father, I also want to make a commitment to be a person who is willing to share this good news, this message of life, with everyone around that we can reach. Father, I know that you have so many people that you want me to reach. And so I want to be faithful to the Great Commission to preach this message of life to as many people as will listen. Father, use me to a great extent to reach people with this message of life. And I pray for every single person here as well, Father, that we would make that same commitment be ambassadors of life, to be obedient to this great commission, to preach the message of life to those around us. Father, we know that some will reject, but we don't know who those are. So we preach to everybody, because we know that many will be saved, and you have given us the awesome privilege of being ambassadors to carry this message of life to those who will be saved through our testimony through our words. Father, thank you for the privilege of being that ambassador. Help us to be faithful to the task that you have laid upon us. Father, this is the only purpose of life for us, this message of life. Thank you for the message of life. Thank you for the resurrection of Jesus that began this message of life. We celebrate that this morning, Father, as we pray in Jesus' precious name. Please stand as we close.